Hello, and welcome to the first episode of a new podcast from The Conversation. Each week, we'll be bringing you expert analysis on the world's biggest stories. And groundbreaking new research explained by the academics behind it. In this episode, we're talking to three experts about the three separate Mars missions due to arrive on the Red Planet in February. What we're looking for is evidence of past life. We'll also hear from a researcher who has just carried out a rare survey of public opinion in Belarus, more than six months into protests there over a disputed election. Half of the protesters thought I go out on the street, at least my voice will be heard. I'm Gemma Ware in London. And I'm Dan Marino in San Francisco. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly. So, Dan, why is it such a big month for Mars? Essentially, it's a big month for Mars because three separate missions from three different countries are all arriving at more or less at the same time. And that's just kind of wild. And so who's going to be first? First is the HOPE mission from the United Arab Emirates, which launched on July 20th of last year from an island in Japan. That is the sound of history. The sound of HOPE itself with the UAE's mission to Mars. That's the first mission due to arrive. It should be reaching the red planet on February 9th. The plan is to get an orbiter, well, orbiting Mars. Okay, so the United Arab Emirates was the first to leave and is the first to arrive. Now, who's next? Next would be China. They launched their Tianwen-1 mission on July 23rd. (laughs) Tianwen-1 is arriving just one day behind the UAE orbiter on February 10th. This Chinese mission has actually three separate parts, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Okay, all three, that's a lot. What about the final mission? The final mission is NASA's Mars 2020 mission, which is carrying the Perseverance rover. That launched on July 30th. Engine ignition, two, one, zero. Relate and lift off. The NASA mission should get to Mars on February 18th and is carrying the Perseverance rover and even a little drone copter sort of thing. Perseverance will be doing a lot of science, but the main goal is to do a bit of geology and actually stash some samples of rock and soil that are planning to be picked up sometime in the future and brought back to Earth. I bet there are armies of scientists waiting to get their hands on those Mars rocks. I I can only imagine. I mean, the laboratory equipment we have here on Earth is so much better. The discoveries are going to be crazy. Okay, so we've got the UAE, China, and then the US all arriving on Mars at the same time. But why did they all launch within 10 days of each other? An excellent question, Gemma. It's kind of weird to think that Mars will be almost crowded, right? Yeah, busy, busy, busy period for Mars. So this is because Mars and Earth are not always the same distance apart. The planets orbit the sun, different speeds. It's only once every two years or so that the orbits line up and the planets get relatively close to each other. These missions all left last summer so that they could catch Mars when it's closest to Earth. Okay, so just because there's a window of opportunity to get to Mars, it doesn't actually mean that the whole world is going to jump at the chance, right? So there must be another reason behind why three missions are going at the same time. These missions are super complex, require tons of money in spacefaring know-how, and most Mars missions, they fail. There's a lot of dead space junk out there. Okay, so if the stakes are so high and you might just fail, why? Why try? Why Why go all the way there? Well, you definitely get a little geopolitical bragging rights if you can get to Mars. But mostly, these missions are all asking scientific questions. And specifically, they're asking, I think, one of the biggest questions there is. Did Mars once support life? I mean, do you mean aliens? Yes, aliens, though likely long dead and more closely resembling bacteria than a green humanoid, certainly. So to learn more, I spoke to a few experts about the science and politics behind these missions. We're not really looking for evidence of current life on Mars. I mean, unless something actually gets up and walks in front of the cameras, we're really not going to find that. This is Jim Bell. I'm a professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. Jim has been involved in a bunch of other NASA deep space missions. Now he's leading a team of scientists and engineers who have built and plan to operate one of the camera systems on NASA's Perseverance rover. But Mars is not a nice environment neither for people or robots. We know from eight previous missions to the surface and all these orbiters and this armada of spacecraft that have been there since 
the 1960s at the surface itself today is super harsh. Extremely little uh, water, no oxygen to speak of, very, very cold temperatures, no ozone layer, so harsh ultraviolet radiation bathing the surface all the time. This wasn't always the case, though. We're going to a planet that we know was a lot more Earth-like a long time ago, two, three, four billion years ago. Probably never exactly like the Earth, never tropical and, you know, super nice, uh, but still warmer and wetter than it is today where the conditions for habitability, the conditions for life as we know it, probably existed early in that planet's history. That's why they don't expect to find anything alive on the surface. But instead, what we're looking for is evidence of past life, evidence of ancient life. Now, there are a couple of ways you can look for that evidence. You flew all the way the heck out there, you might as well look around on the surface. But what about taking a look below the surface? That means using a drill. NASA's Curiosity rover, which landed on Mars in 2012 and, believe it or not, is still driving around out there, has done a ton of drilling. Curiosity has done some amazing science, but it has a limited toolkit on board. That's where Perseverance comes in. Perseverance rover will drill and core into the surface and cache those little cores into these tubes about the size of a dry erase marker and then put those tubes onto the surface for a future mission later this decade to pick up, transfer to an orbiter around Mars, and then the plan is to bring them back. And that's, that'll be the first time that we've done that. A very precious delivery those rock samples will be. Here's the thing, though. Perseverance can only collect 38 samples, so the teams have to be really careful with what samples they choose to cache. And another important question... Where does Perseverance land to take these oh-so-special rock samples? We chose one particular place, which is a crater called Jezero, which has a beautiful, beautiful river delta in it, preserved delta from an ancient river that flowed down into that crater and deposited sediments on the floor of the crater, kind of like the delta at the end of the Mississippi River in Louisiana, which is depositing its sediments very gently into the Gulf of Mexico. If a Mars Delta operates the same way, then it's a great environment for preserving evidence of things that were flowing in that water, things that came from the ancient highlands above the crater. So when Perseverance sees a promising rock or patch of soil, it will drill down into that, do some analysis, and cache that sample. Hopefully, it contains some minerals or chemical signatures that can only be produced by life. Searching this ancient riverbed is one potentially really promising way to find out if Mars could have supported life. Another way, though, is to understand the Martian atmosphere and how it's changed. That's what the UAE's mission is trying to do. My name is Nidal Gassoum. I am an astrophysicist. I am a professor at the American University of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. Nidal is not involved directly in the UAE's mission to Mars, but he's following it closely. The atmosphere of Mars is key to understanding what happened to Mars uh, from its past to the present. Scientists know that about three to four billion years ago, there was a lot of water on the surface of Mars. There are even still some icy pockets of it left, especially around the poles. We want to understand what happened to that water. Uh, that water must have evaporated as Mars lost its atmosphere gradually. So we want to understand how that atmosphere was, was lost, at what rate, how long it took, what led to this loss of this atmosphere, and obviously the existence or non-existence of liquid water is key to uh, figuring out whether there was any life in the past or life perhaps even in primitive form today, uh, far underground where we still have uh, some liquid water. If successful, the UAE's HOPE mission will place a probe into Martian orbit, and it'll stay there for an entire Martian trip around the sun. That's just under 700 Earth days. The probe will be collecting a bunch of data about the current Martian atmosphere, while also doing some real-time weather satellite duty, uh, tracking dust storms and stuff on the surface. The idea behind this long atmospheric sampling duty is to see if researchers can start to figure out the trends going on in the atmosphere. If so, the hope is to be able to extrapolate back into the past and see what caused all the gases and water in the Martian atmosphere to more or less just disappear. 
While the UAE's HOPE mission will be orbiting Mars, NASA's Perseverance rover will, if all goes well, be driving around the Jezero crater. Jim Bell's job, once Perseverance has landed, will be to operate one of the 23 camera systems on board. The Mast Cam Z Zoom Stereo Color Cameras. It's a similar kind of camera to the ones on the Curiosity rover, but with a zoom. That's what the Z stands for. And the camera is in stereo, meaning it takes two photos at a time that can be stitched together to make a 3D image. Yes, 3D. At the end of the day, though, rock and dirt samples are what the Mars 2020 mission is all about. Specifically, getting these samples back to Earth. But Perseverance can't do that. The plan is for another mission to come and pick them up. Once these tubes with the samples are collected, Perseverance is just going to leave them there sitting out on the Martian surface, waiting for a ride home. NASA and the European Space Agency are, are collaborating, pooling resources on a concept to build and launch a fetch rover with a, a lander that will send a little rover, comes off the lander, goes and gets our little tubes, picks them up, brings them back to the lander. A small rocket would be sent down with the lander. The plan is for the samples to be loaded onto this rocket and then launched into orbit. Oh, okay, that sounds awesome. And then they're in Mars orbit and you've got this, you know, grapefruit to soccer ball sized canister up in orbit there. And an orbiter that NASA and the Europeans are collaborating on will search for that canister, capture it, and then rocket it back to the Earth where it will land in the Utah desert. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, lots, obviously. Parts of this have been done before. Japan was able to grab a sample from an asteroid and return it to Earth, but nothing has been done on the scale of this Mars mission. Regardless of the difficulties, it would certainly be worth it, though. Of course, there is still a ton of science to do on Mars itself, and China's Tianwen-1 mission will be doing some good stuff. The Chinese lander and rover will touch down in April or May after spending a few months in orbit. Once on the ground, the rover will use radar to look for pockets of water hidden beneath the surface. But deep space missions are often more than just about pure science. That's particularly the case for China. In a way, they have already succeeded because apart from the moon, they have never been so far. This is Steph Palladini, reader in economics and global security at Birmingham City University. She says what China is attempting, sending an orbiter, lander, and rover all at once to Mars, is hugely ambitious and has never been done before. But she shrugs off talk of a space race between the US and China over these Mars missions. If there is a really a race, is between China and India. In 2014, India's first attempt to put an orbiter on Mars was successful. Target velocity to be achieved is 1,098.7 meters per second. And we are Cheering now... from scientists at the Space Research Organization in India after the country became the only one in the world to successfully reach Mars on its first attempt. Steph says that China was pretty critical of India at the time. They say, well, India, they can't feed their population. They spend all this money to send a probe to Mars. What's the usefulness? And the Indians say back, well, yes, maybe, but we need to have a space power because we, we don't live with friendly neighbors. It's not a very neighborly relationship. To China, it really matters that they succeed on their first mission to Mars, just like India. They are in competition on Earth. I mean, you, you project on space what you have on Earth. It's uh, the, the same like the US and the Soviet Union at, at the times of the space race. They were in competition. It was war, and it was normal to take that to space because it was a projection of, of national power. Steph says the two countries have a very different approach to their space sectors. China comes from a military tradition that is changing right now, but still very much military involved. India, it comes the other way around. India's space sector has traditionally been led by civilian and commercial interests rather than military, although she says that may change in the future. In recent years, China's space sector is actually opening up to more commercial companies. Like China's Mars mission, the UAE's Hope Orbiter is also hugely ambitious. Here's Nidal Gesum again. I tell people actually the bigger uh, strategic um, objectives and uh, significance of this mission is much more important than the science, even though I'm a scientist and I'm a space scientist. This is the first time 
a country from the entire region, not just the Arab world, but almost the entire region, has embarked on space exploration of any kind, not just Mars. In 2013, the UAE announced plans to send an orbiter to Mars in 2020. That's seven years to pull it off. But at the time, the Emirates had zero space infrastructure. And so seven years for a country that already has a space infrastructure is, is a tight deadline and timeline. For a country that had absolutely none of that was an extraordinary uh, bet. And it is amazing that this was uh, essentially met. The 2020 launch deadline was an important one. The Emiratis wanted the Hope Probe to enter Mars orbit in 2021 to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the UAE. The date is symbolic. It is symbolic in telling people in the region, look, there is really hope, and the name was chosen appropriately, there is hope that we can get out of underdevelopment and become a country that 50 years ago created itself essentially from scratch. In 50 years, you can reach Mars and you can become, you know, a science power and you can produce data and you can have scientists. There is some nostalgia going on, too, for the golden age of Islamic science. The golden age of the Arab Islamic civilization from the 10th century to maybe the 16th or so, uh, for about 500 years, one of the most flourishing branches of science was astronomy. Huge observatories were built, hundreds and thousands of manuscripts were written. But what was most significant about all this is that a lot of that science was pure science. Pure science, meaning it had little practical application. And in fact, when the observatories were first created at the beginning of the Golden Age, the rulers who financed this and hired these astronomers and scientists said, we have found by uh, coming into contact with the old civilizations, Greek, Babylonian, Indian, Egyptian, that these people had, you know, long-standing traditions of science and culture and knowledge, and we want to reach that height and surpass them. The same connection is made today with space exploration. To explain to people, uh, why are we spending $200 million on this instead of, you know, on infrastructure or hospitals or whatever, and the idea is, look, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, uh, our predecessors uh, spent money, created science, and did not necessarily insist on it being applied or beneficial to our everyday life because they valued and cherished knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Another big reason why the UAE is sending a mission to Mars is to give a big old boost to its space and engineering sector. Here's a clip from a promotional video for the HOPE mission by the UAE Embassy in Washington. To universities and research institutions will work on the science. That way we get to build the knowledge and keep the skills. This mission will be the catalyst for a new generation of Arab scientists and engineers. For the UAE, actually launching the mission at all is already a mini success in its own right. But another key moment will be when data starts to pour back down to Earth and, more importantly, gets put to use for science. Even bigger success is when we start seeing papers, publications from that data coming out of the UAE and the Arab world. And in that case, we will have closed the loop. We will have really entered this uh, big community of science production, not just consumption. I personally can't wait to see what comes back from these missions. But a lot needs to go right before scientists can start their work in earnest. Mars is known as the graveyard of probes for good reason. Many missions simply don't succeed. But when they do, what we get back on Earth is, well, it's out of this world. Here's Jim Bell one last time. I think what I enjoy most about pictures from Mars, you know, the beauty of the landscape, yes, but the irony of the landscape. Uh, it looks like a scene out of the desert southwest. But at the same time, if you were actually there, it would be trying to kill you in so many ways. So Dan, it seems to me like all three of these missions need a good helping of luck, as well as the science to go right. Absolutely. About half of all Mars missions fail. So a little bit of space luck would certainly be helpful. And I'm sure all the researchers here across the world will be watching extremely nervously in February to see if this gang of probes makes it safely to the red planet. And we should say that you can read more about all three of these Mars missions on The Conversation. 
including a story by Steph Palladini from Birmingham City University on the motivations behind China's space program. And one from Jim Bell, who's leading the NASA camera team out of Arizona State University. We'll be publishing more analysis by academics on the science behind the three missions, as well as tracking each mission as the data starts flowing back. All our coverage can be found at theconversation.com or by following the links in the show notes. For our next story, we're going to switch to politics. Now in Russia, there have been huge protests in recent weeks by people calling for the release of Alexei Navalny, a leading opposition figure. Uh, That's the guy who was poisoned? Yeah, that's right. Navalny was recuperating in Germany and then returned to Russia in January before being promptly arrested, leading to mass protests. Now, there have already been parallels drawn between these protests in Russia and what's been happening for months in Belarus. Since the summer, massive peaceful protests have gripped Belarus. Ever since a disputed election in the country in August last year, people have continued protesting against the government of Alexander Lukashenko. The man who ruled Belarus for 26 years seems to be clenching his iron fist. Due to the pandemic, and the violent state clampdown against the protests, it's been really difficult for researchers to understand what Belarusians think about what's been happening. But I spoke to one researcher whose team has just managed to. My name is Felix Kravacek. I'm working in Berlin at the Center for East European and International Studies. And I'm in charge here on a cluster exploring young people's political and social involvement across Eastern Europe. And I'm still affiliated with the University of Oxford. Let's start with a bit of context. Tell us when and why did the protests in Belarus begin? So the protests in Belarus, they started way before the election in August itself. Already in May and June, we've seen quite substantial solidarity actions in support of the independent candidates that were running against the incumbent, Alexander Lukashenko. Um, And some of them were fairly large, especially then the closer we got to the elections in late July. There was, for instance, a huge support rally for Svetlana Tsiranouskaya, where, according to independent observers, some 70,000 people gathered. And then, of course, in the aftermath of the presidential election on the 9th of August, the protest really gained in huge momentum. The internet was shut down on the evening of the election, and that brought out people on the street who couldn't follow online any longer what was going on. Um, And then after the election, protests grew and grew, gained a momentum over August um, and September, included a general strike in mid-August. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, she claims to be the real winner of last month's presidential election in Belarus instead of incumbent Alexander Lukashenko, who was proclaimed officially with over 80% of the vote. So the Electoral Commission in July barred Viktor Babarika from running. Um, He was probably the most prominent of the oppositional candidates. um, And the Electoral Commission thought that a woman would have nothing to offer against Lukashenko. So they thought that she would be the weakest of the independent candidates and therefore decided that she would be allowed to run. But they obviously miscalculated the momentum that she was able to generate. So... There was this initial outpouring onto the streets just after the the election happened. What was the government's reaction to that? So the government reacted in a very brutal and determined way. Security forces deployed stun grenades and tear gas on protesters who'd been marching against the president, Alexander Lukashenko. The crackdown that we've seen was quite severe. People were very badly injured um, right on the election night itself. We know that at least five people died and thousands were detained, sometimes short, but some have also spent a couple of months in prison and they were kept in prison under conditions that don't comply with human rights regulations. And moreover, the government was absolutely not willing to engage in any kind of dialogue. So it was repression and no interaction with the protesters. As protests were growing, kind of state media was talking about the harvest in August um, and there was absolutely no consideration of what was going on in the streets. And that was the immediate aftermath, but Things haven't stopped, have they? What's the situation now, six months, nearly seven months later? No, things certainly haven't stopped. I mean, the peak of the protest has ebbed, that is to be said. Um, So the numbers that we've seen in August and September, they've been kind of dwindling down over the last couple of weeks. Um, What we still see is kind of an almost ritualistic Sunday march. Every Sunday since August, they've been the most... 
um, significant mobilizations and that has continued. So we see neighborhoods mobilizing and during the week what we see now is specific groups taking to the streets. So you would see the women on one particular day, you would see students, you would see doctors, but the numbers now are small. So the student protests this week, late January, that we've seen, it was probably somewhere between 30 and 50 people who were walking across Minsk. But the situation is still very dangerous for people who are actively involved and even sometimes for bystanders. So we know that you know artists, writers, they are also being being arrested, even though they might not have been on the street. Okay, so let's turn now to your research. You said you research political opinion and and social opinion in Eastern Europe. It's not just Belarus, is it? You look across the region. Tell us a bit more about the surveys that you do. I look across the region, focusing on Belarus, Russia and Poland at the moment. And one strand of that research is to do online surveys among young people and now also the general population in Belarus. And we've done that for the last two and a half years now. Mm. Okay, so you've just done a big round of research in Belarus in December 2020. Let's talk now about what you found. And I know you're still analysing the results. Can you tell me how many people in the sample were involved in the protests? Sure. So we've done a survey that includes 2,000 people um, aged 16 to 64 in the country. And the way it's being done is that you work with an online panel and you invite people who are in that online panel to fill in your survey. Um, and when you set up the survey, you design quotas. So you, you have got your population in the back of your mind. You know that Belarus has X million people, that distribution in terms of gender and these are the cities where people live in. So you set up quotas. You say you need so many women living in cities size 20,000 to 100,000. You need that many men. And then you invite the people who are in your online panel. You send them the link. You invite them to participate. And thereby, by filling in these quotas, you can replicate the population structure to a pretty good extent. And in our sample, 10% state that they protested prior to the elections, and 14% that they participated in protests since August 2020. And was that the level of participation that you might have expected? Was it higher, lower than you thought it would be? It left me a bit puzzled, to be honest, at the beginning, because we have got these images in mind, and we've seen all these videos of hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in Minsk being crowded by protesters. So I thought, oh, that must certainly be a larger share than 14%. But then, of course, when you put that back into context, so if you take 14% of 5 million, that's 700,000 people. So that's actually quite a lot. Okay. And and maybe just put that into some wider context, because you've been doing research in this region for a while. I mean, how does it compare to what's happened before 2020? It's a huge increase. So before 2020, when we asked, for instance, young people who are always, you know, more likely to go and participate in protests, between two and three percent of the young people, and by that I mean people aged 16 to 34, would say that they got involved in protests. And now we are looking at 14 percent. So that is a significant increase compared to what we've seen before 2020. Let's turn now to why people are coming out on the streets. So what did your research reveal about about the motivations of people who answered your survey? The driving motivation that we see in our survey was the shock about the state violence. Um, so 80% of those who went to protest, they said that they have seen the violence, um, they've heard about the violence, and that is something that they found just unacceptable. There were other motivations as well that are quite important. So one is, for instance, that... Half of the protesters thought that that was the only way to be heard. If I go out on the street, at least my voice will be heard and I can show to the to the state, but also to the kind of world that was watching the movements in Belarus, that we are one nation. And so that pe- because people are watching, they feel more motivated to, to go out. Yeah. And what about the demands that they're asking for? So you, you talked about their motivations, but what do they want to now happen? So they want proper elections. That's the most frequently mentioned desired results. The other one is the investigation of violence that ranks really high. And then the third point is a desire for Lukashenko to, well, he should step down. People think that he's completely disconnected from the population. Okay, so even people who didn't actually go out to protest still feel this way about about the situation. Exactly. For instance, it's more than a third who says that they want new elections. More than 50% 
say that they have no trust at all in the president and rather no trust is given by nearly 20%. Wow, that's nearly 70% of the population who exactly. really don't trust or exactly. don't have much trust in their, in their government. Yeah, exactly. Russia's President Vladimir Putin set up a police unit to support the embattled Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko. I mean, really interestingly, in, in January, in, in the early weeks of 2021, there have been widespread protests in, in Russia against the um, detention of the opposition uh, leader Alexei Navalny. And actually, there have been many commentators who've drawn links between what's been happening in Russia and what was happening in Belarus. And, and I saw some reports saying that people were chanting long live Belarus on the streets of some of the cities that were protesting in Russia and even holding up flags, the red and white flag that's become a symbol of, of the Belarusian protests. What do you think? Is there a spillover here or could there be a feedback loop going on between the two sets of protests? Absolutely. There's spillover. There's a feedback protest and has been since at least July 2020, when in Russia's Far East, in a region called Khabarovsk, there have been protests for eight months now. And people have also expressed in Khabarovsk their support of what happened in Belarus and the other way around. So there's a huge awareness of one another. Um, half of Belarusians have got friends or relatives living in Russia. And that sense of spillover from activists I have spoken to does indeed exist in so far as activists in Russia now feel somewhat empowered looking what happens in Belarus, that, you know, it's possible to bring 14% of the population out on the street. At the same time, the conversations that I had were also you know, more cautious than from, from other people's assessments, saying that, but Belarus also shows us how deeply ingrained the authoritarian system is, and that despite so much pressure from below, these systems might just continue to exist. Um, so it goes both ways. Yes, encouragement, we can bring people together, but also a warning that, wow, to change an autocracy, the protests themselves might not be enough. Interesting. One to keep a watch on, and I'm sure you'll be doing more surveys on, on that in the future in both places. So uh, thank you so much, Felix, for your time today. Thank you very much, Gemma, for your interest. If you're looking to read more about what's been happening in Belarus, as well as the ongoing protests in Russia, we've got a ton of good scholars who are writing about that too. Definitely. And Felix has just written an article with his colleague Gwendolyn Sass about their new Belarus survey, showing the results in a bit more detail. Each week to end the show, we're going to be hearing from a different conversation editor from around the world. This week, we've asked Ines Kusana, one of our colleagues based in Johannesburg, South Africa, to send us a voicemail with a couple of recommendations of stories she's been thinking about. Hello, my name is Inas Kosana. I am a health and medicine editor for The Conversation. I'm based in Johannesburg. Top of mind today is COVID-19 vaccines. So a bunch of um, candidate vaccine trials have been happening around the world and the results are slowly starting to come in. And one of the latest trials to release results is the Novavax vaccine. Trials were held separately in the UK and in South Africa. And we spoke to the principal investigator of the South African trial. His name is Shabir Madi. He is a professor of vaccinology and director at the South African Medical Research Council's Vaccines and Infectious Disease Analytics Unit. He's also affiliated with Vets University in South Africa. So apart from speaking to us about the results of the trial and, and what they mean in different settings, Professor Madi also explained to us why taking part in vaccine trials does not automatically mean that a country is going to actually receive those vaccines and what must be done to ensure that. You can hear from Madi himself in the podcast in Pasha that he recorded with us, as well as read the story that we've written. The second article I want to recommend is by Rachel Amma Asa Engman. She's an associate professor and adjunct lecturer at the University of Massachusetts. She spoke to former Ghanaian president, the late John J. Rowlands. While he rarely gave interviews, she puts together in this article a number of interviews that she had done with him over the years. And in this interview, he explores a number of topics, looking at heritage tourism in Ghana, explaining how he went about getting it off the ground when he came into office and how it has continued. And he also touches on this complex relationship between people in Africa and the descendants in the diaspora. And yeah, I think it's just a really enlightening piece. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.
That was Ines Kosana at The Conversation in Johannesburg. That's it for this episode of The Conversation Weekly. Thanks to all the academics we've spoken to in this episode. And thanks to the conversation editors, Miriam Frankel, Vigil Trevedi, Jonathan Est, and Inos Kosana. You can find links to all of the expert analysis we've mentioned in this week's episode in the show notes. Or head to theconversation.com, where you can sign up to get a free daily email by clicking Get Newsletter at the top of our homepage. This episode is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. Thanks to Alice Mason, Stephen Kahn, Imriel Morgan, and Zoe Jazz for their help getting this show on the road. And one final thing, if you like this podcast, please tell your friends about us and go please give us a review on the Apple Podcasts page. It really does help. Thank you so much for listening and we'll be back next week.